not necessarily did they say, did you do all the things? I think that was more of an internal evaluation of like, I don't know if I did all the things, but I think more than anything, they tried to make me realize uh, everything that we will, <laughs> however we want life to go, doesn't always happen how we want it to, to go, or it doesn't go as planned. And so um, what it, what's going to define you, Natasha, is, is how you bounce back from this, like what you do after this, like this whole you not making the team doesn't define you. Welcome to the to the car ride home. I'm joined by Natasha Watley, one of my favorite players to watch. Not always my favorite player to play against, um, but can I call us like coworkers now? Because I feel like every new uh, opportunity, where I'm somehow trying to work with you. No, Jamie, we're teammates, man. We're like beyond coworkers. Like we're forever entwined. We're te- we're teammates. I like that because we never got to play together. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go teammates. Well, since. This is the car ride home. I want to set the stage first and uh, get us into the car. So first off, really important. What are we listening to? What what music are we listening to in the car ride home? Oh my gosh. Funny, funny, funny story. So um, growing up, I, you know, I still do. I love hip hop. I love rap. I love R&B. Uh, my dad and I always going to practices, pitching lessons, batting lessons, all the things. We listen to the radio version of things. Snoop Dogg comes out and obviously we love Snoop Dogg and my dad just like thinks he's the best dad goes out and buys Snoop Dogg's album we have a tournament in Fresno I'm in Southern California I live in Southern or I grew up in Southern California so that's like a two three hour drive he feels like he is like the dad of the year I got Snoop Dogg album we can listen to it literally I mean not good but every other word was a bad word my dad my mom in the car was like, are you kidding me? Like you went out and bought this album. So that's what we're listening to. Hip hop, Snoop Dogg's first album that came out. Um, not the edited radio version that we like to listen to. It was the uh, explicit, horrible. Um, my dad was not the dad of the year. I can, I can roll Snoop Dogg. I like it. What about uh, where are we stopping to eat afterwards on the way home? Ooh, good question. Um, You know, honestly, in the morning, we were a McDonald's family. Can't go wrong with like a Egg McMuffin from McDonald's, hash browns. Um, Afterwards, my mom tried to put her foot down. So we would probably try to stop at like somewhere a little bit level up, like an Olive Garden. I don't know if that's a level up, but um, probably like an Olive Garden or something like that. That wasn't fast food. Isn't that funny? I used to eat like Jumbo Jack burgers at 7 a.m. before soccer and softball games. It sounds disgusting <laughs> right now. Like, how did we even do that? Like, all right. Insane. Speaking of car ride, you already kind of hit on it. How how much time growing up playing did you actually spend in the car? And what's the most memorable car ride home that you ever had? Whether it was good, bad, um, at any point in your career, what's the most memorable one? We spent the majority of our time in a car. Um, Growing up in Southern California, you're either going to Riverside, either North Orange County, San Diego. We probably spent probably a good 80%. And even during the week, I was doing pitching lessons, hitting lessons, doing all the things. Uh, So that was the time my parents and I bonded. I was only child. And honestly, I think that that's how we built our bond was our car rides and Um, you know, whether we were just discussing life, discussing my parents' lives, uh, anything. Um, I will say my most memorable drive home was not a good one and sad that that's the one that I remember. But I think it's pivotal when I think back on my softball career. My senior year of high school, I got invited to the junior national team tryout. The junior national team tryout was in Chula Vista, San Diego. So that's about a three hour drive and how it worked. And I'm just aging myself on how they announced the team. So now when they announce the team, you know, it's an email, it's like, you know, technology was involved. The way that they announced the team was they would put <laughs> a piece of paper on a wall and literally, they would tell you at 7 p.m., we will announce a team and you literally come out of your rooms and go look at this paper. So this is the last day of the tryout. That night, they announce it. And then we're supposed to spend the night there. The following day, you get to travel home. So this is like a 7 p.m. roster gets put up. I did not make this team. 
devastating. I, I held it together. I held, I held it together until the next day until my parents came to pick me up. And that three hour drive home, I cried the entire way. But I always talk about this story because it was a pivotal moment. At that time, I was a senior in high school, already at the time committed to go to UCLA. So I was kind of feeling myself. Um, I would say I showed up to the tryout, not prepared, but just, you know, like, I'm going to make this team. You know, I know all these girls that are here and literally the worst trial that I had, but I think it was a moment of humbling myself and, you know, you anything that we earn, we got to fight for. And I look back and like, did I do all the things um, to make sure that I was going to be on that list when that paper went up? And I don't think that I was or that I did. And I think I learned from it. Um, but that three hour drive felt like a six hour drive because I literally boohooed the whole entire way. But I held it together <laughs> the night before and then and then just cried the whole time um, from San Diego home. First off, it's crazy to me that Natasha Watley didn't make that team. So I would want to go back and see who's on that team. But second, I always think because our parents play such a pivotal role in, in our just journey throughout. So what were your parents doing? If you're crying, what were mom and dad doing on that car ride? Office, definitely my support system, my support system, but also trying to make me learn from the experience, you know, and it just this replicates life. Like anything in life, like is not always given to us. Um, not necessarily did they say, did you do all the things? I think that was more of an internal evaluation of like, I don't know if I did all the things, but I think more than anything, they tried to make me realize uh, everything that we will, <laughs> however we want life to go, doesn't always happen how we want it to, to go, or it doesn't go as planned. And so um, what it, what's going to define you, Natasha, is, is how you bounce back from this, like what you do after this, like this whole you not making the team doesn't define you. Um, are you going to continue to practice? Are you just going to quit? You know, ultimately, it's like your decision. And that was the conversation that was being had and forever grateful for my parents. It wasn't like any, you know, reprimanding me or putting me down. It was more so, what can you learn from this, Natasha? How can you be, be better? And yeah, like sometimes life, it sucks. So good. I, I could think about too, just that role. It's, it probably is even harder for your parents watching you go through that too. But I would say that was a pretty pivotal moment. You went on and you could... I mean, I think of your career at UCLA, your professional career, two-time Olympian. Uh, I would say that you definitely took that as inspiration and have used it. And Tosh, I'm going to say this on record since this is being recorded, but you were my all-time favorite player to watch. And one of the first softball players when I turned on the TV and watched the Women's College World Series, I'm watching the shortstop at UCLA. I'm like, and I come from a small town in Texas. And I played with the boys. So like, I'm watching you play. I'm like, dang, look at her range. Like, all right, if this is how softball is played, I'm going to move from baseball to, uh, to softball. But and we could go on and on about your career. I actually want to talk about what you're doing now and, and probably obviously took a lot from your playing days um, and clearly somebody really passionate about, passionate about creating change in softball. So can you give kind of a broad overview um, of all the softball things you've been involved in now in your professional career off the field? Yes, quite a bit of things. I just, I feel so lucky that I have the opportunity to still stay in the game. Um, the probably the most recognizable thing that most people associate with me, associate myself with is my nonprofit, Natasha Watley Foundation. And I started that in 2009 after just seeing that black and brown girls weren't represented well enough. We were super underrepresented in our sport. And so that became not only a passion project, but I feel like it's kind of, kind of become like my purpose. Um, how can we diversify the game on every single level? Um, rec ball, travel ball, the college game. Um, and we're seeing growth. Like, I, I, it's just so refreshing, you know, and I'm kind of bouncing all over the place. But just the other night, I went to UCLA versus Howard game, a historical night, the first scheduled game versus an HBCU. Um, and it was powerful. I got to bring some foundation girls that they got to see endless possibilities. I could go to an HBCU and compete at a D1. I could go to UCLA and compete at, like, there's just, you know, like, for me, to be a spectator in that moment, like literally giving me chills right now, um, just that this sport of softball is for everybody. And that's like literally been my life's mission that 
you can achieve and exceed and succeed and do so many things in the sport. So that's the, the foundation. Um, I also do a lot of stuff with triple threats. Obviously I was a triple threat and I think that triple threats are a dying breed in our game. And so that has become my life's purpose to make sure the importance of being a triple threat remains in our game because I just think the dynamic of being an athlete who can do all the things adds so many elements to a softball game. Um, defenses are better now. Technology is better now. It's just a needed element or needed skill to, to have people defenses be on their toes. Um, we're facing dominating pitchers. So if we can put, continue to put the ball in play, that's important to me. Um, so I work with a lot of triple threats virtually online, and then now just venturing into doing some stuff in person here in Southern California. And then I also have a travel organization, um, just very <laughs> off the ground trying to get it going. But honestly, my goal is to be able to see an athlete through her entire career. Obviously the foundation, I'm introducing it to a community that's underserved. Um, but you know, I want, I am an inclusive <laughs> young lady who wants this game to be in front of everybody. And how are we doing that? And to be able to hold their hand and hold their hand travel ball wise, and also to be able to see them go off to college, um, just to be able to support athletes from the start until the end. I love it. Well, I'm going to dive in and there's a couple of two that you didn't mention that I'm going to dive into with major league baseball, um, and with Japan, but just start, you, you hit on a little bit and I was going to ask you, obviously getting more softball players of color. And I, and I, if I look around, obviously I know we, we have work to do. Um, but at least in, in our world at the travel ball, we are starting to see a lot more diversity. Um, and now mm -hmm. head coaches, and I know, again, we have a lot of room to go, but we're starting to see more and more even head coaches. Um, but what, what are you seeing? Um, and what are some things that, that we can continue to keep doing right now too, to keep on that path of improving? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, there is a huge increase. I think I just read an article the other day that was put out by D1 Softball that we are, there's five, 6% of athletes of color or black athletes in D1. That's really low. <laughs> but I would challenge that, you know, when I played, that was even lower, you know? So when we talk about room of growth, you know, there's definitely visually when I go out to a softball game, I am seeing more and more girls of color. Um, I think once we get to that point, when we're looking at college number D1 numbers, that it's equal across the board, whether white, black, Asian, um, that's a true inclusive uh, demographic. And I, I just, we're not there yet. So what we can continue to do, um, and I think especially when we talk about girls of color, um, when we're talking about inner city communities, softball is not a sport that they think about first. Um, it's not put in front of them. So how, what are the opportunities you know, as a community that we are putting in front of them? Are we inviting them to the clinics? Are we bringing the clinics to them? Um, are we showing them the possibilities? And I think that that's just been a motivator for me is, how many ways can we show them that this game is great and that this game is for them? You know, bringing them out to the UCLA softball game, the versus Howard the other night, um, things that we're talking about doing, bringing them to see the Alliance all-star game, seeing the elite of the elite uh, high school athletes competing and playing and like showing them that, that that's a possibility. And like, so that stuff fires me up. And so there's just so many things that we could do in our local communities of just continuing to bring the game to them continuing to show them the possibilities and show them that this game is for them. So you say triple threat and, and I remember playing against you as an outfielder and it did, they kept me honest. Like I vividly remember one of the times I tried to cheat and play up and you smoked a ball over my head. So what exactly, if anybody's listening that doesn't know, what is a triple threat and what do you think makes a great triple threat um, hitter or person as well? What qualities? Yeah. So a triple threat to me is someone who could do all of the things. They can bunt, they can slap running through the box. They can hit for power, stand in. Um, also off of those slaps, they can do a soft slap. They can use the ground. They can use a hard slap. Like literally to me, a triple threat is someone who's undefendable. Um, someone who has so many 
options when they come up to the plate that they can pair it with any defense, any pitcher, any situation. Like you just don't know how to defend this athlete and why it's so important. It's just the, the feeling that you get when, you know, you can step into the box and like, I have something to pair this pitcher's rise ball. I have something to, you know, that can match in this situation of a runner on second. Like I know that I can get myself safe and I know that I can score. It's just a powerful, powerful feeling. And I want athletes to feel that like that power of being able to be in control of the situation, being able to read a defense and know that you don't have to be perfect. It's just literally causing chaos, putting pressure on defense and, there's no feeling like it when you could step into the box and know like I can own this moment. Um, and I, I get to control this moment. I don't know if I've ever asked you this question, but I think of um, a lot of young hitters, right? They they're right-handed. They start off, maybe they're, they're kind of fast. So let's switch them over to the left side. When did that start for you? Were you always a, a lefty or when did you actually switch over um, and then evolve into a triple threat? Great question. I started slapping when I was 13. So up until then, I was a righty hitter and I hit for average and I was a pretty good righty hitter. So I'm going to say that I'm putting that out there because this is probably my biggest pet peeve (laughs) that most people will turn their athletes to the left side because they were not so great of a hitter on the right side. And so like, I want to like stop that right now. I want athletes that are moving to the left side for it to be just an added bonus. Like we are going to add an element to your game. You were already good on the right side. And obviously there's going to be those situations where, you know what, you know, maybe it's not working out, but I don't want that to be the main reason why we're turning athletes to the left side. So when I first turned to the, the left side, I was 13. So in my book, I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty much like the late bloomer considering the athletes that I'm working with now, which is a good thing. That means our game has evolved and changed. I, turn to the left side. And when I first learned, I would start my out my at bat on the left side, I would get two strikes. And then I, I call it the walk of shame. I would have the walk of shame back to the right hander batter's box and like finish my at bat on the right side. It's crazy. Like, it's just like, I would never advise any athlete to do that now, like start and finish your at bat on the left side. That's how you're going to get better faster because I literally already equated it to failure. Like I already got two strikes. Like it's failure. Like I'm going to the right side. So I I just think it's just super important for athletes to stay the course. You're going to learn a lot faster starting and finishing your at bat on the left side. So that was going to be my question because I do see that. I think I did that at one point in my career too. Like, oh, let me switch switch on back <laughs> over to the to the right side. Who, yeah. um, when you think of our game today, who who are some of the triple threat hitters that that we see? And who's one of your favorite slappers or, or triple threats to watch right now? In the like in the college game right now, yeah. So I'm going to put on the radar. She's a freshman. I got to work with her in my uh, online course and game changer stuff is Regan Johnson. She is a freshman at Arkansas uh, from Texas. Like literally she is a spark plug. Like she is so fun to watch. So when I first started working with her a couple of years ago online, she would send me these videos and I'm like, whoa, like this girl is so good. Like, why does she want my help? And immediately I'm calling all of my college coaching friends. Like, is this girl on your radar? They're like, yes, duh. I'm like, okay, great. Like, cause she's legit. So she's a freshman at Arkansas this year like legit. So she's one of my favorite to watch right now. Um, my other favorite, which as of late, she has it. And I can't believe I'm going here, you know, I'm totally a Bruin, but you know, the Oklahoma Bruin rivalry, Jada Coleman, but she hasn't been slapping all that much lately, but her power game that she's been able to develop over the last couple of years, like it's been kind of impressive to watch and like, she's pretty dangerous. She's pretty quick. She's fast, but she slaps too. Just as of late, haven't seen her, but she's one of my favorites to watch. Don't tell anybody that I told you that, but obviously this is recorded. Everybody would hear, but I'm a huge fan of Jada Coleman as well. So I'm putting, I'm putting that out there. There you go. I'm not supposed to like Oklahoma Sooners at all. That's a good point. <laughs> Boy, shoot, you said Arkansas. My head immediately went, we play Arkansas tonight. So I hope she's not successful tonight. But any other game, she uh, she can be. Well, you say you say Jada, and I think of her, I think home runs recently in power because of OU, but you're right. Like, she does have that ability, which I think keeps 
keeps the defense honest. So if I'm somebody right. and I and I'm moving over to the left side or I'm starting left side and I want to be a triple threat, where should I start? Like what if I'm a power hitter, should I add slapping into my game or if I'm a slapper, how do I build into adding more of a power slap and a power game? Great question. I think when you move to the left side, obviously what you're working or starting with, I, I think the story that I always share was when you would have first seen me when I was a freshman, starting from 13 to freshman in high school, I predominantly was like a tap and go. Like I did not have any element of power game. So um, I think anything can be developed. And so like, as I went, I started to add different tools, how to bounce the ball. Now I'm working on drag bending. Now I'm working on stand. I didn't really work on standing in until I got to college. So I, I say, you know, start with where you're at. So if you are a powder power hitter and you, you just right now are hitting from the left side, let's work on just trying to put the ball in place, running through the box, you know, tapping and going, bouncing the ball and just trying to build that element because you want to pair opposite. So if I've got a power game, I want to find something that's a short game to pair it with. So on the flip side, if I don't really have that power game and I'm just really good at just, or I'm just a beginner, I'm just trying to work on putting the ball into play, uh, bouncing, tap and go, then I'm going to work on maybe a power slap or a hard slap. So I want to be able to have at least two things I'm, I, that I'm going to be building off of, uh, so to speak, if that, that makes sense. But I think it just, that's the beauty of it is that once you start to had that mindset of I'm going to be a triple threat. You don't have to have all the ingredients right from the get go. It's like this thing that can evolve and develop over time. That's a good point. Well, I'm going to make the like cheesiest transition ever and talk about being a triple threat off the field. Um, <laughs> and I specifically, because I know you have a ton of experience now, not only your foundation, but in travel ball, I know you've done work with major league baseball. You've spent so many years in the Japan professional league as an athlete and as a coach, so you, the Olympic stage, the world stage, all of it, you bring such a unique perspective. Um, I remember calling you, I think it was June or July of 2020, and we were getting ready to launch this thing that wasn't yet called the Alliance Fast Pitch. But I reached out like, I don't know if Natasha's gonna take my call and if she even has time for this, but like, we gotta get her involved. Um, so I just, I wanna take you back to that moment and, and what made you say, Yes. And not about necessarily the Alliance, but about the state of our game um, and what we can do with mm -hmm. fast pitch. But if you go back to that moment, what, what made you say yes to wanting to be a part of the Alliance? Well, the immediate reason why I said yes was the state of where our sport was. It, we just, and I, what I told you is like, we just have all of these different silos that are like functioning at high capacity, but not working with each other. And that was all the way down from rec ball, all the way down up to our pro league, right? And what organization entity that could come into our game and really kind of merge and bring all of these different levels of playing, different entities together, different organizations, like that's what we led with, with the Alliance is like, how can we work with everybody and really trying to put the player first and thinking about what does that player need? How can we allow a player to grow in this atmosphere? Like, can we support that? Can we do that? And that's what we, that's what we started at the Alliance. And I'm like, I'm completely 100% in, how can we make a playing field for our players? much better than what it was. What are you seeing, especially um, you do a lot of work with Major League Baseball, and I know you and I are both really professional, or pro really passionate about the professional league. Um, what are you seeing like starting to shift in our game? What do you see, what change do you want more of to really elevate our game for the, for the youth players? I honestly, I will say at the youth level, I am seeing great things. And like, obviously if we could, give our athletes more exposure throughout the country. And I think that that through the Alliance, we're doing that. I really feel like we're in a good place at the youth level, to be honest, um, where I think we're lacking is at the rec ball level and at the top of the ch food chain, the professional level. So I really think we're healthy and, to, you know, I, I'm up for this conversation, but I just think that we're doing a good job of showing elite travel ball athletes, the path to college. And I think that that's our strength. So when you say youth, I think just when we go to the rec ball, like it's just dispersed, like it, in local communities, 
rec ball is not strong. I grew up playing rec ball and I was able to play rec ball until I was 12, 13 years, 13 years old. When I first turned to the left side was when I first started to play travel ball. So just, I had this long time where I was able to fall in love with the game and that there wasn't that pressure of, or path to college or anything like that wasn't even on my brain. It was just literally like falling in love with the game. And so I really think at the rec ball level, when you talk about youth, it's just fragmented across the country. We can really do a better job of piecing that together and making that experience for those young athletes longer and more intensive. And like, it's not like, it's not how fast can I get on the travel ball team? No, like enjoy that journey and really fall in love with the game. Yes. Nailed it. Well, maybe we'll have to come back because we got a, a, an announcement coming up soon. So we'll come back and talk more about the, uh, the rec level. I am going to pivot because you and I could sit I know we, we both are passionate about professional softball and making careers for our players that these little girls can dream about not only playing professionally, but really making a, a living through it too. You spent so much time in Japan and I don't know how many people know about all the opportunities that exist in Japan. Well, and I guess they're, they're growing too. Right. But what does Japan do so well? What do they do different? What has made the Japan Professional League um, successful for so many years, in your opinion? What Japan softball does so well is <laughs> collaboration, cohesiveness, working together. Uh, honestly, you, you know, me going over there and playing, I am forever grateful for the opportunity because it allowed me to extend my career. But I will say sometimes when I do go over, I'm extremely jealous of what the, their infrastructure and what's been built there. Uh, what they do really well is they pay attention to detail. They are in it purely for the investment of their athletes. And I have seen that since the time I very first played Japan on the national team in 2000 till now to see the growth of the Japanese athlete because purely their pro league um, in the past was just to invest in their athletes. It wasn't to make a profit. It wasn't to do anything. And so just to kind of set up the stage on how it's structured is each company or they've got companies that will have a softball team. And it literally is a line item on their budget where they are purely <laughs> investing and pumping money into allowing girls to come work for the company and allowing them to play softball and be paid. And they're obviously employees of the company. Now in the last year, they have stepped up the league where now they're looking at revenue sources and trying to bring revenue to a league and become the best professional league in the world. But they were, there was 25 years prior where they were just literally having each company be a line having a you know company have a line item on their budget uh, we're just purely investing and now they've built <laughs> the level of competition and now they're in a phase where they're looking to profit off of a pro league or you know obviously allowing their athletes to be more considered professionals um and not necessarily um, employees of the company interesting can you explain what when you go over to japan kind of what the structure is are there other Americans on your team? Are there other players, like foreigners on your team? Um, and what does the season look like? Like how, how does that, how is the season structured over there in Japan? So the season is six months out of the year and they play three months in the spring, three months in the fall. And they do that so that in the summertime, their uh, national teams can complete, compete and play on each team that they have there. You can have endless amount of foreigners now. So when I just talked about how they just changed the structure. So prior, because they were simply in it to invest their in, invest in their Japanese athletes, they only allowed two foreigners. So ideally at the time, American pitching was very strong. So they wanted their athletes to see American pitchers, catchers, um, Australian pitchers and catchers, Canadian pitchers and catchers. Um, but now the league has involved, evolved. And now, like I said, it's pretty much the teams with the bigger budgets are the ones that are succeeding because they've changed their model of, you know, now our, our athletes have developed. Now they can, it just now depends on the team's budget. You know, you can have one foreigner or foreigner, or you can have five or six. There's a team uh, with Erica Pionk Pionkstelli that she plays on. 
they had four foreigners this past year. So they had one from Italy, two from Australia. Sorry, two from Italy. Erica is half American, half Italian. So two from Italy, two from Australia. Give me your your first memory of going over as a young player to Japan and just culturally um, of what that experience was like. Yeah, that was my first year on the national team. We played in the Japan Cup. And honestly, it's like complete culture shock in terms of, you know, just visually what you're seeing is all Japanese. Um, but they're just so hospitable and like the most, the kindest people, genuine. They just really are fanatical and like they just want to see a good performance. They just want to see a good game. Um, so I just was really impressed with their culture of like how giving and genuine they were of wanting to see performance and, and see athletes thrive. Um, my first experience going over there, uh, I want to say it was 2001 was my first year, but that was on the, on the national team, the first time that I went. I wanna, I'm going to throw some rapid fire questions out at you to, to put you on the spot here and, and close this out at the end. So you've played at, at all the various levels. Um, been very successful at every level, had some great teammates and opponents. Who is the toughest pitcher that you've ever faced in your career? The toughest pitcher I've ever faced was Yukiko Ueno. Um, I'm giving it to her because that 2008 game in 2008 Olympics, just couldn't figure the girl out. And then got to continue to play her in Japan. And, you know, some days I thought I figured her out and I, you know, was successful, but more times than not, I was not successful. Um, just her ability to adjust and change her game. She would be like two different people on two different days. It was incredible. Most competitive pitcher you've ever played behind? Lisa Fernandez. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, I'm like, I can elaborate. <laughs> like easy. Like she's just, Fair she's enough. everything. The way that she prepares and she trains. Yeah, it's easy. Is there any catchers that would make you think twice about stealing on them that you were nervous to steal off of or against? Ooh, good. I've never been asked that, Jamie. That's a great question. And I'm going to go with no, like I'm a competitor. Uh, I can't, I always played with the best catchers. So I think I was pretty lucky, but I think there's not, yeah, there's not anybody that I can pinpoint right now. Cause I just think like, I'm, I'm a competitor. I want to compete. So I want you to try to throw me out. Let's go. Nobody made you think twice. Okay. I love it. <laughs> you remember Heather Scaglio? I played, I played with the best coaches. Yes. Fair. She threw me out a couple Fair. times. There you go. <laughs> she was scary. <laughs> she was good. All right. Uh, favorite, favorite slapper to watch of all time, other than yourself. Oh, gosh. It's tough. So Caitlin Lowe. 100%. Um, I feel so lucky that I got to play with her. So half the time, I don't think I got to watch her because we were competing with each other, with each other as teammates. She would be one. And then one I admired looking up to was Allison Johnson. Allison Johnson played at Arizona. She grew up in Irvine. So I just literally like followed her entire career. I grew up in Irvine as well. She went to, we went to the same high school, different time period. She's a little bit older than I am, but She's the one who sparked my interest of like, that's what a slap hitter looks like, man. Like, okay. Like I could do this. Um, so between her and Caitlin Lowe. What about shortstop, your favorite shortstop to watch? And then now your favorite. So before, as you were a young player, and then who's your favorite now that, that you're watching in the game? Uh, growing up, I loved Dot Richardson. So Dot Richardson just, I mean, I think, her presence on the field it was like what drew me into her. So I'm going to go with her first, Nicole Odom, now Reese, Nicole Odom Reese. She played at UCLA. So when I used to go watch UCLA games, she's the one that I used to watch. I'm like, Ooh, I want to be a Bruin just like her. And then now my favorite shortstop. Oh, it's so tough. It's either Brie Perez or Sis Bates. So, I mean, obviously you can't go wrong with Sis Bates. We all know her energy, the little fireball that she is. But Brie Perez is like this little silent thunder that is incredible. Like she just makes plays so easy and simple. Like there's no you know flash to it. Like she just gets there and gets it done. Uh, 
she's done and graduated, but that would, those would be my favorites. All right. This one. <laughs> All right. You're on meetings. We meet every other week with Marty Tyson, Mike Stith, Tony Rico, three of the coaches that have been coaching since you played travel ball. You got to pick one based on coaching style. Who whose coaching style as a player would you fit the best with? Ooh, I don't even know. Okay, so can, I'm gonna like do a slash slash, and you're telling me to choose one. So in terms of like motivation, just not you know like that kind of daddy figure that you don't want to let down. I'm gonna go with Mike. But in terms of like my style of play, uh, defense, slap hitting totally Tony. And I actually went to Tony Rico for slap blessing or sorry, hitting lessons and slapping when I was younger. Fun fact. If you didn't know that. I love that. I love that. I put them on the spot and asked who they thought I would play for just to see what they would say. (laughs) All right. Last, last question, Tosh. Um, Legacy. I always, coach Evans would always talk to us about legacy. Um, off the field now as, as your career has changed and you're more of an ambassador and entrepreneur off the field, what's Natasha Watley's legacy going to be in softball off the field? My legacy off the field. I hope that a young girl, you know, either knows of my name or learned my name and thought because of her, I can. And I think that that's just powerful, whether it be playing um, whether it be staying in the sport afterwards, um, Natasha could, so, so can I, um, I just want to be an example of what this game has done for my life. It's completely changed it. Like I, I, I don't know anything else. Um, all I know is all of the good, you know, obviously there's the ebbs and the flows of, you know, just being in the sport, but more good than bad. And, I just want that next young lady, young woman um, to feel that. And if I'm responsible for that, like more power to it, but I just want to be able to, my legacy is just to empower the next simply. That's it. I love it. Well, thank you for what you do. Uh, I, I think you are already accomplishing that, that legacy for sure. But thanks for, I'm going to say this because I'm going to make sure this doesn't get uh, get cut, but thank you for, I'm super honored that you're a part of the Alliance. I love what you're doing across the board for our sport. You're a true ambassador for the game. And thanks for, for hanging out with me.